Uh, well, thank you. And thanks for letting us do two rounds. I wanted to um, keep digging on this question of USAID contracting. Um, I think that, um, you know, you talked about how it's the contract and the contracting itself that's a problem. Um, you know, could you talk a little bit about some of the impediments to changing contracts? And in particular, if there was a difference between how large NGOs and smaller NGOs were uh, dealt with in particular, we know smaller NGOs had a hard time working with USAID, but was there any evidence that those smaller NGOs were actually less impactful? Was this more of an administrative capacity? How can we improve USAID's ability to work with those smaller NGOs if they are, in fact, just as or more effective? Um, I would have to get back to you for more details on that. Uh, overall, I think the successes we saw, uh, the, be, the, the, the more important, I would say more important, but the more successful contracts were usually smaller and usually smaller NGOs doing them. And I, I don't know if I can draw any conclusion from that. Uh, we did hear a lot of complaints by small NGOs that it was difficult for them to contract with USAID. Uh, but I don't have the particulars on that right now. I apologize. I can get, get back to you. Um, small actually was better. Uh, if, 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 you know, my, my gut reaction, we don't have an audit on that. But uh, spending a lot of money did not. And that was, a, as you can see from our reports, that was a problem we saw. We thought if we could throw more money at the situation, it uh, would improve. Now, there were also some small subcontractors or contractors who did a horrible job. But there are some major contractors. I mean, some of these issues, I, I, mean, I can talk about the rule of law program, an important program. But, you know, I saw it so much, and I don't know if these were big contractors or small contractors, where it looked like it was, a, 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 you know, a, a tourism uh, job uh, or, or program uh, for uh, lawyers uh, in the ABA. So I would end up having to talk to lawyers coming in on this rule of law program who couldn't spell Afghanistan, who had no concept of the culture and the law they were doing it. But they were being paid by, I don't know if it was a major contractor or a subcontractor, to fly over to Afghanistan for a couple of weeks or a month to talk of old war stories about how they were a prosecutor or defense attorney or they did corporate work for AT&T, which has no relevancy to Afghanistan. Now, I can't tell you who brought them over, but we kept running into them. Likewise, we saw major contractors. I, I, the uh, the uh, Promote program was a real boneheaded uh, program, to be very blunt, where they were hiring people because they had to show success immediately. That was some major contractors. They were hiring kids off the street whose only qualification was that they were a carbon life form and breathing. They didn't know anything about women's issues. And I had Mrs. Ghani even tell me that. You created this program in which to enter it, you had to be a high school graduate. And she said, by definition, that eliminated 90% of the women in Afghanistan. And you, as the aid administrator, was saying this is going to be the greatest successful program for women in the history of the United States. I mean, Mrs. Ghani quit in disgust from even talking to those people. So I, I, I can't tell you that was a large contractor. I don't know who it was, but they were so desperate. They just were hiring college kids. Well, actually, can I jump in and, and ask yeah. a follow up on this question? You yeah. know, I think part of this, as we have sort of talked about before, is that we had folks who didn't really understand the context of Afghanistan right. and what they were working on, in part because of the rapid turnover of yes. civilian and military staff. As you know, Afghanistan, um, people say one year versus two or three. That's typical yes. of a, a episode rotation. How legitimate is the concern of the risk of clientitis? And how do we go about balancing that with our need for our folks to actually be understanding and experts in the countries they're serving so we don't keep making these mistakes? Well, you have to write it into the contract, make certain these people have some knowledge, and somebody who's reviewing the contract should insist, and this goes back to monitoring and evaluation, that it sounds logical for a country like Afghanistan. 
or like a country like Haiti. I think you asked the question before, maybe some other member about, is this going on in Africa and other places? It very well could. And that's what my staff tells me who produced that lessons learned report, because we're not writing good contracts. The government is a horrible organization for writing contracts. And this is what I've said before. It's not that the people in Afghanistan who worked for the U.S. government were evil or bad or stupid. We gave them a box of broken tools. And I've used that term before, and that's what we did. Our contracting authority is broken. Our HR program is broken. Our appropriation cycle is broken. How we reward people in the government is broken. You need to fix that. I mean, I had contracting officers who repeatedly told me, the only thing I'm judged on is how much money I put on contract, not whether any of the contracts work. And by the time my tour is done, I don't even care if they work or not. You're gone. You don't stick around long enough to be held accountable. That needs to be fixed. And you need to look at what's going on in Africa and around the world with aid contracting, state contracting, and DOD contracting right now. It could be just as bad, but I don't know. That's not my job to look at USAID outside of Afghanistan. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. We've uh, got a lot of work to do on this committee, um, and I will yield back. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. And uh, Mr. Sopko and committee members, that concludes our questions. Uh, Mr. Sopko, first of all, thank you for all of your years of hard work and earnest examination and analysis of uh, both our successes and our failures in Afghanistan. And we absolutely heed your, your advice and your warning about being aggressive in our oversight. Uh, and so thank you for everything. And I, you know, you still have your job there, so you haven't, uh, they haven't fired you. Uh, you joked you would be the only one that got fired. You still have your job, which is good. We're glad for that. And again, just want to say thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you. That, and if we can, if we yeah. can help you at all, Mr. Chairman, don't hesitate to call us. Uh, we're here to help. Thank you. Absolutely. And that concludes our hearing, and we will adjourn. Thank you. Thank you.